Okay. <clears throat> for now, we proceed with nonsense. Hello, everybody. By the way, thank you for this running. The other thing is, I'm partially deaf. Um, so if I don't, I, I think I did get it just where I'm saying, but like, if, if you say something and I don't hear it first up, that's just, that's my head having problems. So that's my fault, not yours. So to let me know or wave if necessary. Um, but so yeah, this, this is a sort of, the, this is also the name of a, a blog that I, I've had for many years on sort of like um, using algorithmic uh, models for uh, building physical systems. With. So this is so this is a, this is a perfect title. Um, we're going to be mostly focusing on this, um, basically how to create life from scratch, which was the fun sort of thing that sort of led me into the VR sort of space. Um, but it's also about this, <laughs> about the bigger picture of what we're trying to do with it. Um, and you know, trying to sort of take these ideas and push them into making something, you know, hopefully interesting and transformative. Um, so, talk about like, who I am. So we'll do a little bit. Uh, it has been somewhat covered, as it turns out, which is great. Um, but I'll sort of give you a little bit of sort of context. Um, uh, what we've been trying to do with this particular project, uh, what we discovered along the way, and where we're headed next. Um, there's a bunch of very silly things I'm involved with, so if anything comes up, you're like, actually, I would rather talk about that other thing. And we can discuss that at the end, because there are many interesting things here, hopefully, that we can talk about. Okay. Um, so who am I? Author of the Rebeteer Science Fiction Novels, um, published by Galantz, the great and good, lovely publishing people in London. Um, so, of course, I met now. Um, I have a day job at the moment. I'm working as basically data science lead for this outfit called Product Ops. Um, they do sort of like um, consulting work, sort of like uh, bespoke software, data, business practice, and that sort of stuff. So that's how that's how I make enough money to live. Um, but I also have a couple of startups on the go, of which one of them is the one we're going to be talking about here. Um, the other one is uh, a, an attempt to disrupt artisanal spirits. Um, so that's a sort of a, a kind of a design your own gin. Um, Type of sort of company, so that's 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 been very fun. That one's somewhat time-consuming at then. And, and also, I run a, a YouTube channel um, in which I discuss a great number of random scientific topics, um, which is sort of like a thing that I'm trying to grow. <laughs> that one's still that one's still little, but that's that's another fun thing that's going on. So, as you can see, really badly stretched. Um, do I, I'm trying to do too many things at once, but that's the only way I know how to exist. Um, firstly and foremostly, and the reason for main uh, fabric of this talk is I make models. Um, here are four incredibly illustrious um, uh, academic institutions, none of which has provided me with a credential of any sort whatsoever. Um, we have uh, Berkeley, Princeton, St. Cruz, um, and this, <laughs> this is actually this is a, a national lab of Pisa. Um, but basically, what I've done over the course of my life, my wife was the real academic. Um, she was she's an astronomer, and she does like she was, you know, looking at galaxies and things like that. Um, and I, um, I trailed around after her for, for several years. Um, but because I myself had a background originally in machine learning, I found myself hanging out with a lot of scientists. And it turns out there's quite a lot of scientists who, if you show up and you're interested in learning about a specific field and you'll write code for free, um, they, they would like some of that. So you know, the, the, that's what I that's what I did. And, you know, as a science fiction writer, it was a wonderful way to do research. It's like, you know, it was a way to sort of immediately connect with and sort of engage with a bunch of different subjects. And I'm kind of a sort of sort of uh, curiosity sponge, and they're all pretty much all different kinds of fields of, 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 of scientific research I'm, I'm interested in one way or another. Um, so uh, as we trekked around from one place to another, I got involved uh, rather unexpectedly in a set of collaborations of different sorts. So, you know, after having originally formed out of academia and then getting into tech, being you know, originally in London, faculty floors across the pond, uh, I found myself back in the land of academia, uh, steadily taking, um, doing research more and more seriously until I basically where I'm at as a researcher here. Um, and then, and then after that, I got the science fiction book deal and fell outside of it, all manner of silliness. It was a very, very disorderly approach. But I make models of basically a lot of different scales. So everything from, you know, sort of economic modeling and you know, social modeling, um, uh, machine learning stuff, sort of uh, uh, collective social insect modeling, genes, you know, sort of artificial chemistry for the purposes of modeling life, uh, right down to the uh, particle physics and the study of planck space spacetime. Um, none of it professionally, and I'm an expert in none of these things. I'm a tourist, a, a persistent, endless tourist in all walks of arts and science. So it's sort of like a, a perfect, sort of like absolutely marvelous, maybe, maybe a jack of all trades, or something of many trades, but absolutely a master of none of it. Um, but, but we're very happy to be having the, the opportunity in life to participate in many different things, and long may it continue. 
Um, so, uh, when my wife finally decided she didn't want to be a proper scientist anymore, and, and, we, were, and we were like, okay, let's go home, and home was Santa Cruz, which is where we had to have a house, we moved back. Um, and I was, I was writing novels. I bumped into this fantastic fellow here, um, Ethan Summers, a wonderful human being, who is an Emmy Award winning uh, visual special effects artist who's worked in Hollywood for many years. And of course, as many, some of you may know, the, the, uh, the video effects industry is sort of like has undergone a kind of sort of an implosion as have many industries where a lot of a lot of the, the skilled um, skilled work gets sort of outsourced overseas and things like that. And if you're somebody who's like, you know, even if you've you know modeled Gettysburg and gotten to go up and collect awards and stuff like that, it's still, you know, the 21st century comes to us all and it's a need to pivot and think you know intelligently about what happens next. So he had a he had a specific vision he wanted to follow through on where he wanted to take um, the state of the world, um, particularly with regards to things like the environment, um, the fact that we've sort of like, you know, entered into this sort of, the world is getting increasingly complicated, and he wanted to make it accessible to people via things like multimedia displays. Um, we were thinking a little bit about VR at the time, but it was like, you know, via, via all different kinds of media, the ways in which the, how the world actually worked was suddenly accessible to people in an intuitive way. And this tallied enormously tightly with the vision I myself have had, which is the, you know, one reason why I've been writing science fiction for many years is an, an attempt to communicate. First you learn about the world, and then you try and share your enthusiasm and your curiosity with these things with everybody that you know and everybody that you can reach. Um, so the two of us sort of buddied up to try to see what we could see what we could do with it, see if we could like take this vision and sort of lurch it forward to, to the future. Um, so anyway, that's that's that was the beginning. Um, but if you want to take this and put it in front of ten-year-old children in a you know in a sort of a big interact you know in a, in a in a conference space or something like that, you know, have a bunch of children dressed up as R two D two, you know, doing a thing. Um, you can't you know, this doesn't necessarily particularly look like that. We we need something better than this. Um, so what I decided, um, what I did is I, I looked at uh, that sort of the, the idea of you know lipid membranes and self enclosure, and I sort of thought, well, can we build a little toy physics model, super simple physics model that we can use as um, as a basis for them taking this idea of how life can self organize and make it kind of make it a little bit more like the kind of life that we might sort of see if we looked under a microscope. Um, so this was my, so <laughs> this rather ludicrous matrix here is my attempt to sort of encapsulate the, the idea of, well, how do you build something that's going to self-organize to make something a little bit like lipid membranes? The idea being that if we can build something like that, it suggests the fact that we've got enough representational complexity in the system that we might then be able to go and make living things in it. So what this means is we're going to basically have three kinds of particle. We're going to use a sort of a, a little sort of cellular automaton kind of model where the particles move around and they like to stick near other kinds of particles they like and they like to move away from particles they don't like um, to see whether or not we can get structure spontaneously emerging. So the idea is that like um, blue likes red, the red likes blue and green. Um, green likes red. So we're going to have red in the middle and, and these, these ludicrous things are like different levels of infinity. I was looking for a su suitable symbols. So basically, green hates blue, um, so these ones don't want to stick near each other. And then, so blue, blue likes blue, but it's sort of like, you know, this is this is a donut. So I was thinking, well, quite likes, but once you've had one donut, you're kind of like, ah, yeah, I'm not going to eat you know, like that. That was enough donut. Um, so somewhat affinity, we all like we all like the taste of donut, but then there's a kind of a limited amount of what we want. Pretzels, I was looking for the food that was the most meh food I could think of. It's like, yes, okay. Yeah, there are some pretzels. Um, so it's sort of like staggering indifference. And then down here is like printers. Like, we will all visit the printer. None of us loves printers. Um, you know, sort of like printers are those things that you kind of like, you fantasize a little bit about, you know, kicking in the field. Um, but the idea being is sort of like, you know, we, we, oh, we'll tolerate the printer, but we, we don't want to particularly spend a lot of time around them. Um, so the idea is, you know, these different particle types have different levels of love and hate for each other. And so you take these particles, you sort of stick them in a bucket. Um, so here we are, we filled them, we first time walk down. If we've taken life out of the equation, we just say, have we got a physical system that's good enough to do some interesting things? We put these dots in here, and the question is, will they actually form something a little bit like, you know, layers and membranes? If we, get, if we populate them with these affinity, if you like, how much they like each other? And the answer is, 
yeah, it's kind of fun. Interesting things happen. And what you see that we've started to get like red stuck in the middle, we've got green on one side and blue on the other. But you know, blue is a little bit more fond of itself than green is fond of itself, or you know, you get the idea. So as we long we let this run, we'll see that essentially um, we start to get little, little enclosures starting to form, little sort of pockets. Um, little sort of membrane sort of things happening. So when I found this, I was like, okay, this is a physical model where we might be able to make something that works. You know, there's enough, there's enough that's sort of like suggestively constructive here that we might be able to have some fun with it. By the way, chunks of this talk were the chunks that talk part of the talk I originally gave to the SETI Institute, so you guys are getting <laughs> sort of like shrunk down version two of like of actually sort of sitting there with sort of, you know the the great the, the SETI Institute, Jill Tomter and the likes of she watched this talk. Um, or bits here. Um, so anyway, there, there you go, like, whoa, we've got fun, exciting things happening. Um, so now, instead of having three kinds of particles, we'll be deciding in advance which particles like which other particles. So let's have eight types and decide at random. So we're going to have eight different particle types, move them around, have, you know, like, we might either purple really loves yellow but despises cyan. Um, and, you know, that sort of idea. You, you have all these different relationships set at random. What happens? Digital schmutz. It's sort of like we get we get little sort of pockets of novelty technicolor lint forming. So that's that's interesting, but it's less fun than the lipids because they're just forming blobs at random. Um, but that's okay because what we're looking for is like what can we do with a particular computational invention that we made up. Um, this is still like this provides like not so interesting. So fine, good. Now let's take the copying operation thing that we talked about before, we put it on top. So we instead of, as instead of just the particles moving around, it's like, let's say you're a red particle. As well as moving around and having particles you like, you have a rule inside you, and it says, if I'm near a blue particle and a green particle, I copy state from the blue one into the green one. So the red one is near, a, at the end it's near two blues instead of blue and green. Does that make sense? Okay. So, Simple, just like this, but we put on the fact that different colors of particle can basically do copying operations. So a little rule embedded in every particle. And then what happens? Do we get anything different? Are, like when we take our two kinds of bottle and squish them together, what have we got? It's far more interesting, I think. Interesting stuff starts to happen. So we've got like, uh, We've got little clusters that are starting to form. We've got little sort of little blobs that are here. And we also have these sort of areas where you get these sort of sudden splurges of certain particles sort of moving away from everything else. And every now and then you start to get cascades forming. And sometimes you get iterative, you know, sequences of combat that are happening where one kind of particle then devours all the resources of another kind of particle. And then and the longer that we run this, the more kind of interestingly suggested it becomes. And we start to get these little areas where you get certain certain combinations of particles that will tolerate each other, starting to form little hybrid pockets. Um, so something kind of fascinating is in here. We've got, we've got a good enough physics system, and we've got a good enough biology system, even though both of them are incredibly simple in isolation. We've cheated nature to some extent. We've taken replicated mechanics and shoved them on top of a very simple form of particle mechanics, if you like, and we're starting to get these, oh, ah, that you can, you know, get these exciting, it becomes quite sort of novel and suggestive. We are getting, uh, we, we are getting a different kind, and different kinds of particles are forming different kinds of structure. Um, so we're getting little sort of collaborative thing here. Here's, here's a yellow and cyan thing that's trying to move around and, and take over some other stuff, and it's being eaten. Um, you get the idea. So there's enough here that's kind of novel and suggestive that we sort of think, okay, we appear to have something that's quite lifelike, but if that is really true, then we should be able to run the simulation longer and faster and use the awesome power of you know, technology to do um, to you know to take us to the next level. So what happens if we basically make make the you know a, a lot more a lot more dots, a lot more particles, and then basically have the, the number of particles they can see around and increase that and also accelerate the hell out of this thing. So basically we just leave it running over Christmas. Um, and then you know did what did we see some interest when we got back at the other end? Um, so you know we do getting quite interesting blobs of self-organization here, but we, we like because this is the 21st century. Oh, the first is another question. I forgot this one. You know, the other question was like, does does our particular biology rule matter? So in other words, does the particular each each particle having the ability to copy um, something near it specifically as opposed to random copying? If you do random copying, 
you get digital smoke. It's a slightly more interesting digital smoke, and you still get some of the stuff you were seeing. But broadly seeing, speaking, you don't get the same fun pattern of cascades and things that you got before. Some of it's kind of interesting and normal, but it's sort of there. Um, so instead what we're going to do is we're going to scale up larger, faster, longer. So remember, if, if our idea works, we should see something that looks more like what you would see you know, under a microscope in a Petri dish. we put in this are really incredibly simple. You know, we've got little explosive bursts of the release of um, spores. Uh, we've got little creatures moving around trying to find their way to sort of eat something. Um, we've definitely got some sort of acts of reproduction uh, going on. I, I, I particularly like when you get these little creatures that have like uh, a nucleus, or you know, they're, they're designed in such a way to, to like, if you try and make combinations of particles that have motility, um, in the system, it's actually quite hard to do, but you let the system self-organize, and lo and behold, you get several different kinds of sort of like motile glider structures that just invent themselves before your eyes. Um, and you also get different strategies. You get the kind of explode and make many spores like seed release, that shows up as a strategy. But you also get these kind of like flicking systems where you get sort of like, um, like arms and tentacles that sort of basically lurch backwards and forwards and collect food. And you also get these kind of like loose spongy collectives where there's sort of like, it's like a sort of a, a low density mass. Um, this sort of like, it's also seemingly good for sort of, uh, for collecting sort of uh, uh, resources that show up. So we can see things, you know, we, with these systems we're seeing things like predator prey dynamics that are suddenly showing up. And you can actually track the mechanics in here and it looks quite like the Locke Volterra um, equations, you know, those sort of systems that, that people will often see um, when they're trying to do you know, evolutionary biology. Right? Yes! Does the behavior stabilize, or is there a chance that if you left it running for five years, radically different behavior would start to touch? Have you got any idea where this, how this particular wall set? That's an excellent question. And the answer is, you, for a while, it gets steadily more interesting as you're seeing here, and you're getting more and more optimization in the environment. Uh, more and more evolution is taking place before we rise. However, by stacking the deck um, to make life so easy to generate, I mean, what we're seeing here is like stuff that took millions of years to happen on Earth. We're getting some kind of loose approximation to it that's happening incredibly rapidly. Um, but by stacking the deck that much, we limit what life can do. So you can imagine that what we need to do in order to get life in the system is you just have to roll a six. When we got a six, you know. Whereas if you think about the sort of prebiotic soup that existed on Earth, where there's so many different kinds of molecules, you need to roll, you know, a million sixes uh, in order to get life to start. The good news is that the life had a lot of tide pools, so it contained a lot of molecules, so it had plenty of room to play. You know, there was the opportunity for life to do a lot of experiments. So. That fact that your deck is stacked also then limits how far it can go because the, the combinatoric space that your system can explore is less. Now, we have ways around it for, for, for future reasons, but yeah, sorry, go on. There's also the fact that you picked a two dimensional plane. A three dimensional space does have uh, there's loads of geometric properties that are really different in like weight propagation and stuff. I'm so glad you pointed that out. Yes. <laughs> we didn't just want this. I mean, this is a two-dimensional plane, so it's very easy to have you know, the net distance between certain areas where species were evolving is that much higher. But some of it's, it's easy to get life to start in, in this kind of setting than in a three-dimensional one. You know, but this is this was our first. We, at the point at which we got this, we were kind of excited. You know, this is you know we've taken our idea of like what life is, and we've demonstrated that we can get pretty precise <coughs> forms of self-organization. Now, would you say officially, specifically, that this is life? Um, it's debatable. We'll come on to that in another slide. It does some of the things that we would expect from the living system, but not others. Um, but you get the idea. We've got, you know, little, little guys with little carrier things on the front, and then little traveling around. I, I just love the sort of random ingenuity that sort of, that sort of tends to sort of show up in, in systems like this. But you see, the longer you leave it running, the more you get like this flippers of Flippy things are very, very successful right now. Um, but anyway, why do we put it in 3D? Yes, <laughs> this fine gentleman's point. And why are a cloud? Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
why don't we put it on a bang up to make particle system? In actual fact, why don't we invent a new kind of particle system that will actually support um, sort of bonding? That will, you know, a lot of the I don't know how people play around with people playing around with uh, stuff in VR. One issue that shows up in games with particle systems is that particle systems, the particles are usually pretty dumb. You know, they don't respond to a um, particularly interesting local forces. You can have wind, you know, or you can have sort of particle emitters and so on and so forth. We wanted to do something that was way cooler, so we had to sort of figure out how do you build a GPU acceleratable particle system that will actually support um, a lot of short range forces. Um, because while this whole process was going on and we were sort of playing around with resources, as soon as we had interesting stuff, my, my business partner, who's the the you know the, the movie special effects specialist was like Foster more you know in 3D you know full color you know, we wanted it to get more and more exciting um, so we really pushed the envelope and you know we were talking to Nvidia and getting hold of various cards and things like that but at this point you see so at the beginning we get digital schmutz um, but you'll see as time goes on you start to get little sort of structured jellyfish that are forming and sort of eating each other and you start to get you know, reproductive events and these kinds of things occurring. So what we have here is a sort of a, a novelty jellyfish tank um, made of these little sort of um, these little structured critters that form. Now, as per your point, it's actually harder to do something that is fully authentically life in this environment because as soon as you give these particles momentum and they're all travelling around meeting each other, the amount of variation across the space drops way down. Um, and also by having stuff for free, that's another way in which you're essentially confining the environment. So the number, the amount of resources you have to throw at the system in order to get something truly lifelike showing up has, has gone way up. We're already facing a kind of problem with the system earlier. But you can see that we, the longer we leave this running, the more interesting the more interesting the, the critters become, um, and the more interesting like the little sort of reproductive events are happening. Of course, in this context, this early on in the system, a lot of them basically look like novelty jellyfish. Um, but um, you do get the odd weirdly rotating star that gets eaten by somebody passing by. Um, but you, you get the idea. It's like the longer we leave it, um, the more interesting these systems become, um, and the more the more lifelike the system it, it, it evolves into a, into a state that's, that's just got has got more interesting things happening. So at this point, um, you know, my business partner was like, this you know, this is something we can take and put in Comic Con stand as you know, and have kids interact with. But it needs to be, people need to be able to reach out and touch it, they need to be able to play with it, and they need to be able to run in real time. So that was the point at which we reached out to, um, to uh, a, a specialist in particle systems, I was living in the Netherlands, uh, and started working with him so we could take the algorithms that I've written. I pre gpuified them, but I'm, I'm not a kind of a, a particle systems expert, so we had to sort of get, in the, get in the big guns in terms of like, trying to make sure that we could actually get the, the whole process to scale up. Um, so we can ask a question. How how lively is it? I have a little acronym that I hold on to. It's a HOMGAR, uh, which I use for like, uh, uh, which is like you know the various different properties that life has. Um, and the way I remember it is HOMGAR, the extremely alive barbarian. And what are the properties of life? So homeostasis, um, not really. Homeostasis like is it self-regulating on the inside? These structures are not really doing that. That's something we don't have yet. Organization, yes, obviously we've seen plenty of that. Metabolism. No, because in this environment, uh, you don't. Life essentially comes very cheaply. You don't have to sort of like be um, eating and reproduction are essentially the same thing in this world. It's, it's a very very simple world. So we're not doing that yet. Growth, yes, you've seen it. Adaptation, yes, we see these things evolving. Response to stimuli, kind of. You know, they're capable of diverting their way towards something they want. We're getting some of that. And reproduction, yes. For a first approximation to a living system, not too bad. You know, that's, 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 a, that's, a, that's a decent start. So, so what? What do we do with this? Well, we took this stuff to um, Sterling Valley Comic Con. We had massive screens, you know, 14 foot interactive screens with sort of like where kids go. It was all sort of connect enabled so people could kind of like grab life and move it around and all that sort of stuff. Um, we had machines running there on site um, you know, with, with sort of like multiple 1080 card stacks, you know, racks inside them so that we could support all the particle dynamics we wanted to have going on. Um, you know, we have a bespoke particle system running in the Unity engine, and um, but we also had two versions. We had the 2D version because we were able to make more concrete science points for those who were interested inside the inside the SETI booth, 
Now the one on the front, we had a fantastic piece of real estate right at the front of the con as you came in the door. So the first thing you saw was like, bang, you know, the creation of life. Uh, so it was sort of a, that was that was really quite fun. We had we had lots of kids coming up and playing with this stuff and, and making life in real time. Start the scene, best with some parameters, press the go button, tsh, you know, a living system will self-organize before your eyes. It's like here is here is at least in sketch form how life started on Earth. You know, albeit you know, in, a, in, a, in an optimized digital environment that's purposefully staged to make a point. But this was a fun jumping up point because from here we could ask SETI's big questions like, when does life show up? Where should we look for it? You know, what are the conditions that support the development and the evolution of life? What is the kind of chemistry that's actually necessary? What we've done here is by essentially making an end run around a bunch of these questions, it created a very useful and effective springboard for talking with people about like where should the search for life in the universe be focused and so on and so forth. So that was that was fun. Um, and we were talking with a bunch of backers for set, you know for the SETI Institute at the time and all of this sort of thing. Things were looking really bright and exciting. Q tumble with you. You know, we had we had a machine that made life. Um, but as it turns out, as many of you no doubt know, when you're running a startup, it can be quite hard to actually sort of like go from a cool idea to something that actually generates sufficient interest that you know the thing is actually capable of generating um, generating income, scaling, and so on and so forth. So turns out you've got a machine that creates life not immediately monetizable. You know, as it stands, um, perhaps that should have been a little bit more obvious for us right out of the gate. But um, you know, that, that 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 is an issue. So we we sort of like you know we we had we had this incredibly cool and we yeah we we reinvented how to do a particle system. And there was a question of like, what do we do now? Um, and so that's like Q determination, also Q VR with slightly thrilling, bang up to date visuals. Um, the idea being that we, this is when we got, this is when we started to get truly determined about it because we knew we were sitting on top of and away. You know, this at some level, creating life was just the first point. It was just the beginning of what we wanted to do. We wanted to talk about complex systems in the large. We wanted to talk about the environment. We wanted to talk about politics. We wanted to talk about everything. Um, and what we had was an incredibly cool tool for making some little living splats, um, which is like, so what do we do? So. We had a vision of what we wanted to do. We wanted to educate by making things and understand, you know, intuitive fun. We wanted to inform people, to make it easier to know things than to be ignorant about them, and to engage people by making social tools and living spaces that made it truly straightforward to interact. So this was the point at which the hard work started. And by that time, we'd run out of a little bit of the money that we were originally our sort of seed funding. We weren't able to secure some big time investment straight off the back of our success with SETI. So that was when it was kind of like the trudge slogging, you know, going and sort of building stuff. And um, Ethan, to his credit, said, VR, let's do, let's make this thing, you know, we've, we've got the interactive screens, we should focus specifically on virtual reality, and we should take this thing and we should turn it into a product that people can download and buy. Um, so hence was born a thing called Primordial Soup. Um, so Primordial Soup is an interactive simulation in which you can play with the with origin of life model, um, where you can there are various different sort of scenarios where you can sort of like sort of step you know literally walk around in if you like sort of a, you're inside the tank filled with the crazy jellyfish and the crazy jellyfish are revolving while you watch and you can grab them and move them about or take creatures apart or emit you know particles that will then form creatures before your eyes um, and you can also sort of play with the play with these very basic sort of dynamics and physical rules. Um, now the question is, if, you're, if you, anybody who's searching is primordial super available yet, the answer is I don't. We were doing a Kickstarter. I don't know if the officially the Kickstarter has actually gone to the point where it's physically um, available to the public. But if you look at Underground Engine um, online, you'll see all the necessary information that will tell you about this project and, and how we're how we're making it work. Um, but we got as far with this, with sort of early release and cooperation with various different educational institutions, we actually won an award. Um, so the, um, the My Hero International Film Festival um, is basically a film festival that's primarily interested in, in, uh, in film that basically has a notion of social justice or is advancing a social good, either making people of, uh, aware of um, topics which they need to be important in the world, um, like you know, uh, changing in the environment or, or social issues, you know, the mistreatment of certain minorities and what have you. Um, so 
they got some extra backing from Oculus, and so they were interested in things like Film 360, and basically were there immersive environments which would help like, bring knowledge, useful, important knowledge about, about unusual things to the public. Um, and they actually went as far as like stretching and to some extent like changing the format of the award <coughs> so that they could make room to, to basically give an award to primordial soup. Because there hadn't been a part of what they were originally doing, because there hadn't been products like this before. There hadn't been a virtual abiogenesis fish tank in which people could essentially sort of, you know, play with creating life. So this was actually it was it was a wonderful process. We got to drive down in the car to LA from Santa Cruz and collect an award, and that was terribly fun and exciting. And and, and talk with people about you know what it means to try to create immersive tools that have some form of like a social vision behind them. You know, either taking a science point about, you know. That's what we that's what we got on to. And with the basis of what we had behind us, we decided that, that another idea which we that I've had in my back pocket that I wanted to explore is the Math City concept that you, that you saw mentioned there. The idea being that didn't think it's a concept of the guy wakes up and he is, yes, okay. So there was a fun movie that was made a number of years ago where this this guy realizes he's living a life in a, in a world where the, the city that he's in reinvents itself basically every night. And the buildings sort of swirl around and sort of everybody sort of find themselves in different relationships that they weren't formally in and have different roles in their life that they, that they, they weren't in before. And I remember watching a movie and thinking that it was awesome. And also I've worked on some uh, some rather simple uh, things. They're not even really fully simulations, but they're sort of uh, environments or tools that they create that you can take relatively simple trigonometric functions, and then from that, um, you can kind of like manipulate uh, objects or you know uh, shapes in an environment. So I thought, given that we're working with VR, why not why not take that all the way? Why not have a why not have a sort of a, a city where there are controls and control points where you can sort of move the levers and towers and sort of build themselves out of the ground and you know the spiral staircases and ramps and you know sort of like uh, turrets and things like this. Um, so I wanted to create an, an environment like that. So we've actually gone we've we've managed to get quite a lot of interest about that. And I actually think there are quite a lot of interesting potential sort of game extrapolations where we can step forward from basic trigonometry to really actually quite interesting pieces of um, of geometrical math, where people, rather than just learning by it being a bunch of dull and dusty stuff that they see on the page, they can be like, you know, what does it mean to have a Fibonacci spiral? It's like, let's make one! In fact, let's make it out of gold and cover it in eagles! You know, there's like, suddenly this is a thing that people will be able to do. Um, so, that's, that's the idea. Um, and, yeah, you, you get the picture. That's, that, that's, that's, what, that's what we're taking things next. Um, 
to where next? Everywhere. Uh, the good news about what we've got going on is that um, we have actually started collaboration with a bunch of really interesting bodies. So the, we, via UCSC, with the ecology department there, you know, they're very interested in working with us. And they, of course, have links out into the California Academy of Sciences. So we're actually, you know, who knows where it will go, but at this point it looks like we're actually going to have some pretty large-scale interactive displays in there. Um, there's also um, uh, the library organization of Baton Rouge is like redeveloping a whole bunch of their library system and is interested to have like interactive displays, sort of immersive technology stuff that they put into public spaces. Um, so we're putting a bunch of effort into sort of interactive walls and things like that, but also looking at all the different possible channels to interactivity. So, so looking at things like you know, mobile apps, because mobile apps provide other different possible interactivity channels. It's one thing to have a space where you can reach out and you know, move life or make cities or things like that, but if it's socially connectable, and I can you know, create critters and you know, squirt critters into something that I then see on the wall, that's arguably even more exciting. You know, I, you know, design organisms and inject them, or, or create strategies, or make contributions, and basically see its stuff reflected before my eyes in, in a shared public space. You know, then potentially you have the kinds of tools in your hands which are able to really solicit broad-scale public engagement in science, and also in the social issues that connect with complex systems. So, you know, so where next? Hopefully. Everywhere. Stuff is, we actually have traction now, and the whole thing is getting really quite exciting. Um, what next? Everything. What I want to do with this platform, the vision that Ethan and I have, is that not just to take you know, the origin of life, which was fun, but there are far more salient topics, and other interesting but less salient topics that would be nice to be able to share with the public. So, you know, down here we've got a simulation that I originally wrote for a science project to do with um, industrialization, the change of social networks in the face of increasing levels of technology. <coughs> what happens when you have a post-industrial economy, and how prosperity can be uh, can be affected um, in an environment where um, where basically the landscape of you know where is cheap labour and so on and so forth. What you know, what are the different strategies? What does Brexit mean? You know, from a complex systems approach, you know, can we actually do things like inform policy through the use of complex systems research? I'm sure we can at least at least have have, have something interesting to say on the subject. Um, this is one that I find terrifying, and I'll happily talk with people about if, if interested in their This is a simulation of the future of democracy, which actually came out of some research I did on uh, what's called the Parliament of Genes. So we're looking at here is taking uh, taking. Uh, Ideas which we know work from um, how, uh, how genes cooperate, how to create systems that are capable of mutually reproducing, and taking that same that same science and using it to be able to understand why and when democratic political systems happen and how we can protect them. Um, over here, we've got semi-intelligent robot swarms. We're basically using simulated Breitenberg vehicles here, so we can sort of talk about what happens when you take. So, you know, machines with different levels of intelligence and combining together some very, very large numbers of intelligent machines operating together. Also, it doubles as some quite nice art. You know, intelligent swarms ideally building beautiful pieces of art in some public space. And the origin of the universe. You know, that one's a little bit less directly salient to the current day, but, but a bunch of the research that I happened to have done, which when I got serious about complex systems, was work related to. Um, to the structure of plankton and space time. And just for pure fun, I would like to be able to share with people, you know, things to do with, you know, how you know how does space work? You know, can we reckon, can we use these kinds of tools to solicit public engagement which might break the log jam in physics between relativity and quantum mechanics and usher in a new age of scientific research? We can hope, we can try, we can try and you know, like empower and energize a whole generation of kids and put the best possible tools in front of them via which they might be able to actually start asking these questions. I, mean, I remember when I was a kid and the computers that were suddenly showing up in my house, the games that I could write on that were about as good as any games I could buy in the shop because nobody knew how to do these things. And there was a whole generation of, of computer people who, you know, people who were software engineers who I think, you know, they had, they felt empowered because the tools that were in their hands were fantastic, and they, you know, they were able to sort of compete on par with, you know, with adults or teams of adults. These days, if you look at the games industry, you, I, I, you can't have a kid who's going to go and build, 
I don't even know what they call that, Hal Halo's old hat. You know, sort of like, you know, Eve Online or some sort of thing. That's, you know, no school child is going to build Eve Online in their bedroom on the weekend. Um, but by creating, you know, a new generation of interactive tools by which it's simple to create complex systems, maybe we can actually start empowering another generation of kids and creating a new set of tools that they can make use of to understand the world. So that's it. I babbled extensively. I have no idea how long the talk was. That's the vision. That's the hope. Um, those are my books again because I'm supposed to do that to remind people to go buy books. Um, and thank you all very, very much for listening and watching and being patient where I battled about a great number of different things. Um, if there are any questions or ideas or thoughts, I'm more than happy to hear any and all of them. Okay, try it open. you know, for the whole of my life. Um, so for me, the, the thing is, I first thought about science fiction as a way in which one could be the advanced guard. You know, you could sort of go out and explore and, um, and you know, try and figure out how stuff worked and then, and then come up with ideas that would maybe go to inform the public dialogue. And I always found it really inspiring when you, like, for instance, you know, one, one example is like Star Trek. You know, they wanted a convenient and cheap way of getting between stars, so, so they came up with Warp drive, you know, and they were making shit up, let's face it. Um, but what was wonderful about that is it actually then went and, and um, it, it, that spread out into, you know, Miguel Alcubierre doing his, like, I think the paper that, that everybody else loved and he hated, where he was like, oh look, I've, I've, for fun, I went and looked at, you know, various solutions to the, you know, to the equations of general relativity, and look, you can have a warp drive, who knew, isn't that funny? And, and of course, I think he had no idea what, what a twist this was going to put on his academic career, because of course, as soon as he was out, there was every track he in the world was like, Full drive! And you know, he was like, oh my god! Um, so, but the point is, it's a fantastic thing, and now there's people in NASA working on the possibility of building an Alcubi air drive. And indeed, some of the ideas in my science fiction books, I, I, I riff a little bit off of some of that research. But if that hadn't been Star Trek, pushing that angle and putting stuff into the public domain, that wouldn't have, that wouldn't have happened. Nobody would have asked those questions. Um, and of course, you know, where did Star Trek get the ideas? Where's that? Where's the social vision that drove that? Well, it comes out of science fiction books. To my mind, science fiction is, uh, I, have, I have a lot of very strongly held opinions about what science fiction can and should be um, as, uh, as a vehicle for basically um, empowering and informing the public. Um, and the thing is, these days, you know, science fiction novels are less, like, there's, there's greater, far greater diversity in, in, um, in the representation of science fiction authors, which is a wonderful thing, but the reader base has, has dropped way down. And you can't make a living as a science fiction writer anymore. It's just simply not, it's simply not a sustainable thing on its own right. 
Um, so what you need to do is like you know be successful enough that you get a sort of like you get a TV deal or some such thing. So what I wanted to do is sort of say, well, okay, so that's 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 one way of doing it. But what are the what are the other ways of, of taking um, of taking uh, these same ideas, the same being an advanced guard, and you know extrapolating out to other ways of communicating with the public. So, I got back into science in part because you know I was spending a lot of time hanging out with a bunch of scientists, but also because from my childhood, total fascination with science fiction, with everything in space, and aliens, and all that sort of stuff, and and because of that, because of, of, of the fact that you know a creative medium makes it feel to people like you know that they can ask questions and that they can wonder, and that you know the the the. the and some of them, there is things to be in awe of in the world. I, I love the, the, the emotion of awe and the capability that we all have to experience this sensation of awe. Um, something I personally am very passionate about on the back of this is that in our pocket, each one of us has an extraordinary device via which you can reach the frontiers of human knowledge with about half an hour's work. Because you can these days write, you know, a page or two of JavaScript in here, um, or the language of your choice, and good complex systems models are deliberately minimal. They're small. They're little. They don't take that much time or effort. You read it, go read a bunch of pop science books, then say, do I understand what I've just read? And you can come up with a little program to test your understanding. And such is the state of complex systems research that the door is open. There are some things that people have studied and done, but the, the, the space of possible simple algorithms is simply so vast that if you are passionate about an idea, let's say it's you know wealth inequality, which was driving a lot of my a lot of my interest in Princeton, um, and you want to understand wealth inequality models, you can do wealth inequality research, you know, on a simple any kind of simple computational device and get to the frontiers of human knowledge and have something new to say. And yet we don't know. We are led to believe that science is something that is all done by the great and good. And you know, something that is sort of like, you know, off in the hands of people who've like peddled for a thousand years in order to get PhDs and all the postdocs necessary. It isn't true. I've contributed to five, six, seven different scientific disciplines. I've got no PhD. I'm, I'm just a guy, you know, but I'm a guy who basically happened to be able to write some code and happened to be relentlessly curious about this stuff. And I strongly believe that the ability to experience that awe and reach the frontiers of human knowledge is in everybody's hands. So it's like, this is what, this is what I want to give, this is what I want to share with the world. There's a sense of like, you know, we all have it, but you have to have that, like, that willingness to just not do something that's pure straight science, something that is a fusion of science and art, something that is embedded fundamentally in an act of play. And from that act of play, all else can spring forth. And you know, play and courage being the two fundamental defining factors by which citizen science can happen. That was a very long rambling answer to your question. Question was here. May I just ask the relationship between traditional AI and the, the kind of coding that you're doing? Do you think there's any relationship? Absolutely. Well, I started off in AI. I was, I was doing machine learning stuff just at the beginning of the good old AI winter. Um, so, you know, sort of uh, late 80s, early 90s. Um, I think there are two pieces to AI. Um, one is the actual specific scientific mechanics of, you know, how we build these models, you know, um, and how they operate. Um, but there's also something wonderful that happened in AI, um, which was that it was, um, if you like, experimental computer science. It was a kind of academic discipline which the world hadn't seen before, which is basically, here's a piece of code. What it will do is, no, we have no idea what it's going to do. It's going to be very hard to debug because once you've got this thing and you've set it up, it might do anything it likes. You know, we, 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 we've, we deliberately created something where the outcomes are stochastic, you know, more, only model statistically. We put this thing in the world. How do we know that we've actually built a thing that does what we thought it was going to do? How do we test it? Also, how do we collect data about it? How do we reason about systems that are just on the threshold of our ability to predict or understand? Um, so I think that philosophy of AI is critically important. And I actually think the reason why there was a bunch of researchers who crossed over from AI into complex systems research is because in some ways it was a natural fit. The kind of code that you write for a lot of complex systems is um, philosophy. The kind of work that one does in AI um, 
is often way more ornate. Particularly, I think that's becoming increasingly true if you look at the you know deep neural networks and stuff that you know Google has championed. Although there's some part of me that still remains skeptical about a lot of that work, and the reason for that is that there's so much of the money in AI research right now is driven towards you know having something like you know a neural network, which you know I was playing with in 1991, and then just scaling it up and then putting a huge number of you know now we know how to make a 452 layer neural network that actually will do kind of like um, error propagation properly. You know that's lovely. It's still a 1991 90, neural network at some fundamental level. Has there been, or, has, has, there been, has there been no change in the way they structure neural networks? Is, is the new stuff? Well, there is new stuff. I mean, but a lot of the new stuff, you know, if you think about the current neural networks, the current neural networks existed in 1991 as well. A lot of these tools are way more sophisticated and subtle now, but a lot of the really cool mechanics, at least as far as I'm aware, that have gone in is like, how do you take the vision that was originally conceived of in the early 90s and actually really give it legs? And a lot of the exploration that seems to be happening now is take those kinds of models and then really push them incredibly hard to see what can be achieved in the way that people formerly hoped they were going to be able to do. However, if you look at, for instance, the causal reasoning revolution that's happening in Judea and Pearl's work and all that sort of stuff, building different kinds of models, or indeed, you know, a lot of sort of interesting work to do with uh, you know, different kinds of neural modeling, um, like, um, what's the word, what's his name? Um, on intelligence, Jeff Hawkins' book, was, you know, even though his startup had to, like, some mediocre levels of success, the work there of basically modeling cortical stacks individually and directly, and the particular mechanics, time-based mechanics of the behavior of those stacks. I think, I think that, that's really, that's some really exciting stuff in there, but as in, AI is, I think, a really hard science to make, honest to God, real sort of macro-level progress, in, despite the appearance of the field. And that is because what you're doing when you try to model intelligence is you're heading directly into a conceptual headwind. We have an idea of what intelligence is and how it's going to scale. You know, so like if I have more intelligence, it will be, oh no, it will be able to do clever things. Clug, 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 clug. I put two pints of intelligence in my cup. Um, therefore, we will be able to predict the stock market. It's like, well, maybe not. You know, because as it turns out, you know, systems don't necessarily scale, you know, in, in, like that we know certainly quite a lot about algorithms. Algorithms don't always scale nicely. You have to make compromises as things scale up. Furthermore, there are a lot of game theoretic systems where if you look at, for instance, you know, are you familiar with Axel Rod's work on, you know, or the line? Quite often the simple, the most effective strategies, particularly in social systems, will be extremely simple. So I think the jury is still out. I think that AI will happen and there's enough money and all behind it now that really exciting work will be done. I think it's gonna be a way bumpier road than people imagine it is. You know, at the moment we're in yet another you know, OMG, it's happening kind of sort of phase, whereas it's what you have to duck out. We've got the time. Yeah. Is there any chance you're still going to be around in about an hour? Um, I'm supposed to meet my wife for three. Online. Really, really like to bombard your emails. Just to well, say, yeah. I'm, I'm going to share Alex's contact details with everyone. Oh, really? Yeah. It's yeah. 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 fantastic. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Pleasure. Thank you guys for having me. I think it's wonderful this space exists, and I absolutely believe in what you're doing. Um, long may it rain, frankly. You know, fusion of science and arts and so on and so forth. It's like. Like this, this is how progress does get made. So hooray for that. Um, any other thoughts or questions or things? Sorry, another question. Thank you for coming. What do you think is the relationship between what you're doing and quantum computing? Oh, quantum computing. Well, quantum computing is a totally fascinating, awesome field. Um, the I think that the the thing about quantum computing is that certain things that we can do mind-wrenchingly fast, as you may have known. There is no kind of, um, the, still Turing machine equivalence counts. So you can't do kinds of computation from, uh, you know, via quantum computation that you couldn't do with a straight old-fashioned Turing machine. Um, and I think the other thing about quantum systems is that, you know, they are notoriously difficult to scale. Um, if I was to personally bet my guess is that is that unorthodox other forms of computing may actually um, yield more value sooner. So for instance, if you have a massively parallel array of GPU processors, 
all of which might make a mistake, and you essentially do a sort of statistical processing, you might be able to get something extremely close to the kinds of quality of answers you can get out of, uh, out of quantum computing without necessarily going all the way to quantum computation town. Because quantum, it's like quantum, quantum mechanics is not magic. Uh, one of the other forms of simulation that I've worked on, which is um, you know, early, early on when I was looking at this stuff, is that I was very interested in the double slit experiment, and I was very interested in the frequent assertions that you get from physicists that, you know, that, that there is, um, that the, if the universe is equivalent to some kind of machine, it's, it's equivalent to a it's kind of like, you know, a, you know, a quantum computer. It's like, well, a quantum computer is a computer. There's no, you know, mathematically speaking, there, there isn't a difference. And so I wondered, well, can I build then, therefore, can I reproduce a double slit experiment on my Mac? You know, and can I get, you know, the same kind of pattern of, you know, when I interfere with the particle, you know, and I can interfere with the display, or, you know, I can get the interference effects on the screen. Yes, yes, absolutely you can. Um, and it's a demonstration of the fact that if I have got a large scale stochastic system, it will produce exactly the same results as a quantum mechanical system. The question is whether or not the incredible speed up you get from doing this kind of distributed stochastic computing that happens in quantum mechanics, like whether or not it's, um, you get enough gain given how fiddly it gets. And I think that it might really provide a lot of gain. It's just like, I think the jury's still out. Um, I'm optimistic, of course, but you know it's one of these things where just like with AI, I don't necessarily, I don't necessarily expect that it's going to be a sort of an easy win and everyone have a quantum computer in their pocket. You know, I think you'll have giant servers that are you know like you know 20 trillion of these you know, scrolls together, and all basically you know and they'll all be super cool because you know having the um, the there will still be a problem to you know you won't be able to have room temperature. Thank you so much. Um, Amazing. You know, room temperature superconductors still won't happen, and so you know, making these things work is going to be tricky to do. There might be cheaper, nearly as good things that you can basically build up, you know, deadly lines and beeswax, but you know, that you can sort of do if you if you have the some not those ingredients exactly. You get the idea. Um, you know, other stuff that will do that will do the job at least, you know, somewhat well. Yes. Was other questions, thoughts? Well, as you say, as it's always up, come up to two o'clock. Yes. I suppose so. Yeah. Anyone that wants to stay on them will be welcome to stay on the tab just to, to say that it might need to be. Um, just to say that it's going to come up uh, here in the fuse box um, on the 18th of the 18th of June. And the 20th, we've got VR event coming up for design and creative user experience um, using for VR and AR. And they've got a gentleman called Steve Bobby coming in, who is here to talk about why use testing is important and how to apply to virtual reality. And it's just a plan to come up as well. So, but if you do want to stay and chat to um, Alex, more than welcome. Um, I'm not sure. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.